thank you for coming. And it's, it's really my pleasure to introduce you to, uh, well, introduce Hugh Possingham to you um, to give a talk. I could, I could have planned this introduction better. Um, I, I could go on about all the difference that Hugh's made to the world. And some of the talk is about that difference. And so I'm not going to belabor that. And I could also talk about, I think, Hugh's actual deep passion for conservation and the environment that um, I think operates at an incredibly granular level as well as a global level. So his contributions to, you know, local conservation actions, the local, you know, um, Oxley Creek bird watching group are um, amazing and, and inspirational in themselves, despite their relatively small scale and scope. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a really true conservationist. And he'll talk a lot about the maths. Um, and, you know, he's, he's worked for some of the biggest institutions in the world, the Nature Conservancy. He was the chief scientist of Queensland. But I just want to pause briefly and, I guess, reflect on his contributions to mathematical ecology in Brisbane. Um, one of the sort of real legacies of his time teaching at UQ from 2000 to about 2017, I guess, uh, was a, an enormous cohort of, of researchers who have gone on um, around the world in institutions that range from non-government organizations to, to government to international sorts of uh, environmental NGOs to, yeah, to sort of carry on the legacy and the ideas that he's brought. And they are, you know, bringing a, a sort of a, a strong mathematical and quantitative and transparent and decision science focus towards environmental science. Um, but yeah, I think, I think they really represent one of the greatest things he's done for us as a group. And one of the reasons why Brisbane, I think, remains a really important place for, for mathematical conservation and mathematical ecology. And, you know, I guess I'd say like, so I'm, I'm a student of, of Hughes, Kate Helmstead is, uh, Matt Holden was a postdoc, uh, Nadia was one of his students. There's just lots of us here who, who come from that sort of, that mold. And so if ever we say we have an idea, it's normally just a pale shadow on the back of the cavern of the idea that Hugh had about 20 years ago. Um, anyway, without any further ado, I will pass him the microphone and set up his talk. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll actually start for three or four minutes just saying why I, why I did what I did. Um, and then I'm going to go into a few stories. There is, the maths content is, is about um, math content if you're a 12 year old. Okay, so this is not that complicated. But I'm really going to talk because I think do you really want to have another set of slides with equations on them? No, I'm going to tell you about how mathematics and simple decision science has sometimes had a huge impact on public policy and the way the world works. But sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it's weird. And I have to say the biggest problem is this. What's interesting is not always important and what's important is not always interesting. That's about sums it up. So in general, it's incredibly simple maths, often very, very simple maths that can be ultimately explained to somebody like a politician, believe it or not, or the general public that then generally has impact because it's very hard to get policy impact <clears throat> and decision making for managers at any scale from the local council to the United Nations unless people actually know what's going on. And most people know bugger all maths, let's be frank. Uh, very, it's, it, is, it is alarming and disturbing, the amount of math illiteracy. So a lot of my life, and I currently sit on 31 boards and committees, and I have three separate jobs, and I'm working as half as much as I used to work. A lot of my jobs is trying to communicate very what I, you would all consider to be very basic logic uh, in a way that's palatable to people who aren't imbued with mathematical skills. Or they may have strong intuitive mathematical skills. A lot of people say they can't do maths because they can't um, do a theorem or a proof or they can't deal with complicated algebra. They might not deal with algebra at all. They might not even understand how to interpret an alpha and you say, what is alpha? that's beyond them. But many, many people actually intuitively have very strong math skills. They just don't know it and they're terrified of the whole situation because of being traumatised somewhere between the age of about seven and 30. You know how this is often, often happens to you? You're sitting and talking to somebody who isn't a mathematician and you say, 
like in a taxi, hey, I'm a mathematician. Now, 90% of the time, that's just the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But occasionally, they'll say, what does maths do? And then you talk to them about maths, and then they talk about, I used to be good at maths. Remember that? They often say, I used to be good at maths until... And then you hear the story of at the age of 12, 14, 16, whatever, until the teacher said I was stupid. Or worse still, uh, girls can't do maths. That I would hope has not happened in this country in the last 20 years. But, uh, or the introduction of probability. Probability. It's hard. So what was often happening is there's these crises of faith that cause people to drop maths. And then they just wall it off. And they say, oh, I can't do maths. Good, I can't do maths, so I'll do other things. And then that's their get out of jail card free, isn't it? They just don't have to do it ever again. And so I think it's really important for all of us to make maths not scary, as simple as possible and as friendly as possible, and make people realise that they're all using maths all the time, even though they may not formally know it. So I have to do a lot of that in my life. I started off largely being passionate about conservation and ecology. I ended up doing a maths degree at the University of Adelaide and being a senior lecturer in, my first job was a senior lecturer in mathematics at the University of Adelaide in 1990. Um, a long, long time ago. Um, uh, so I was doing a lot of maths from an early age, but in the end I was always pushing my mathematical skills to solving environmental problems. And it was a series of accidents uh, that enabled me to suddenly realise that in the field of conservation and environmental science, nobody was using decision science. There was a lot of mathematical ecology all through the 70s and 80s. There was a huge flowering of mathematical ecology. Robert May, Robert MacArthur, you had to be called Robert. Um, all those people, they, they changed ecology. They had fun, particularly MacArthur changed ecology. He died at 42, he's a pure mathematician. He reformed, he, he basically formed the fundamental basis of modern ecology, theoretical ecology. Um, um, but none of that was that practical. To give you a particular example, one of the biggest and most interesting debates was should we have, if we have a choice of a certain amount of area to be conserved, should it be a single large reserve or several small reserves? And there was 15 years of papers, hundreds of papers, lots of empirical data, and the answer was it depends. Should we have a single large reserve or several small? And it was completely unresolved. But the interesting thing is, Real people who are designing protected area systems never even asked the question. It was academics in universities who thought this is an intriguing question and they studied it to death, came up with no answer and the not answer was useless, even if they could have had an answer. So um, I suddenly realised that if people didn't actually use decision science and think about the social and economic consequences of decisions in making policy and management, most of this stuff was pretty useless pretty useless. And that revelation happened to me in 1994 while I was on study leave. The, if any of you end up becoming academics or are academics, study leave is essential. Why? Because you escape and you get to sit around, play computer games, um, kick balls with your children, and suddenly ideas come to you that would not happen in the hurly-burly nature of teaching way too much. So escaping on study leave, when you get that opportunity, if you're pursuing an academic career or any part of your life, if you can get a skate for three or four months, it's very transformative. And then I realised within six months, there were a thousand papers to be written on using decision science in conservation that had never been written. The only area that where decision science had had a big impact well, was in fisheries and, pest and, and agricultural management. But in conservation, the only area where there was a bit of mathematics was protected area and reserve design. Uh, but then there was all these other things we could possibly do. So for example, population modelling, population viability analysis was obsessed about predicting the probability of extinction of species. Hundreds of papers. I wrote, well, I co-authored a dozen or more of those. Why? Why are we predicting the probability of extinction of species? A, you quickly realise that you can't because tiny variation in adult mortality rates makes the probability of extinction of most species 
go from zero to one very quickly. So I can definitely say the probability of extinction of most species, all species, is a number between zero and one inclusive. There you go. There's a fact for you. It's got a theorem or a proof for that. Um, it, a relatively useless field that blue have control, but nobody was asking the question, if I want to maximise the chance of a species persisting, not trying to get to a certain level of persistence, in fact, decision science can answer that question for you. People like Mike and, and both Mikes have done this sort of work where you can build a population model, say, if I've got another million dollars for saving greater gliders or potteroos, then this investment will give me the best chance of it persisting, but I have no idea whether it's going to persist or not. But that doesn't matter. Because all you have to decide is how to spend the money you have. Or as um, uh, Gandalf said, something about all you have to decide is what to do with the rest of your life. Time that's given to you. And so that sort of pervades a lot of the work that I do and why doesn't the uh, slides progress. Because then so I'll go through a few quick examples of stories of simple mathematics. But I'm not going to focus on the mathematics because it's trivial. What I'm going to focus on is uh, sort of often the, the joys and frustrations of getting somewhere or getting nowhere, to be blunt. And I could tell 20 of these stories, and some will make you cry and some will make you laugh. Uh, the first one is a, is, a, is a very simple sort of thing about koalas. One of the couple of the things that I really wanted to say is this one here is, you know, actually you don't need to have a lot of math to be dangerous and influential. Uh, the one in the middle, I think, is really important, particularly for those people who are interested in decision making and optimization, is whenever I talk to maths, to people in policy and management, they think I'm talking about models. So everything to the general public is a model, or not the general public, everything to other scientists like ecologists, everything's a model. And the first thing they say is all models are wrong, and I say yes. Um, but then, then we show them, for example, a problem, which is um, minimise the chance of greater gliders going extinct in this landscape, given a fixed budget and some social and economic cons other constraints. That's a problem. And they think that's a model. And I think it's a translation of humans' hopes, dreams and fears into maths. It's a translation. You could take the problem, how do I spend a million dollars to to optimally invest in greater gliders given some social and economic constraints in this place with forestry, you could turn that into French, we can turn it into maths. And I don't think that's modelling. I think that's problem definition. And all the problems of models are not in that problem definition. Because you're not predicting the future in problem definition. Predicting the future is slightly hard. If you could do it accurately, then, well, you'd be a billionaire. Um, and then the final one is algorithms, which just solve problems, right? And usually they're, what, 99.5% accurate. Now, mathematicians will love to find slightly more accurate and slightly faster algorithms because that's economically valuable, whether you're running economic systems or transport systems. But in the end, you know, why argue about algorithms from the general public perspective? They're 99% right. <clears throat> but they see an algorithm and they think it's a model and then they hate it because they think that all models are wrong. And they're right. This first example uh, comes from... My, one of my earliest forays into public policy, I was a professor of environmental science, it's 1998, I'm 34 years old, and the Minister for the Environment says, we have an overpopulation problem of koalas on Kangaroo Island. That's not kangaroos on Koala Island, it's koalas on Kangaroo Island, just off the coast of Adelaide, where I grew up. Uh, and somebody, a lovely man, a professor of zoology in the 1920s called Wood Jones, thought koalas were going extinct. So he decided to put 20 koalas on... Kangaroo Island's big. This is, this is the biggest Fraser Island. It's 450,000 hectares. It's really big. I'll put 25 koalas there. A few died. Ended up being about 10 females in about 1930 because he was very worried that koalas would go extinct. Intriguingly, guess what else he put on Kangaroo Island? He put um, platypuses, which did okay. Put brush turkeys there from Queensland, which really did not ultimately need our help. <laughs> but well-intentioned. Um, 
the trouble is there's no predator there for the koalas, nobody was hunting them, there's no foxes, no uh, dingoes. And roughly a female koala, and again, they said to me, let's build some complicated models. I said, well, actually, all we need to know is roughly, by, by 1998, when we were going, they thought there were 10,000 koalas. And then people said, well, how can it, you can go from 10 females to 5,000 females in just that short period of time? Because people just don't believe geometric growth. And you don't have to be a genius to do it. Um, the average female koala, in the absence of much mortality, typically she has three offspring, female offspring in 10 years on average. So basically, I just said, well, why has this happened? Because the population triples every 10 years and we can hopefully all multiply. And by the year 2000, as we were coming to the end of our reporting process, yes, 20,000, potentially 20,000 female koalas, probably we thought there were 15,000. Close enough. So that, that is informative in its own right, because most people just did not get it, as you all know, people struggle with geometric growth. But then the interesting thing is, what should we do about it? And we wrote a long report. Uh, we said, go and shoot a lot of koalas. You know, if you say shoot koalas, <laughs> uh, uh, that the international media does not like that. So second page of Le Monde, third page of the Washington Post, Everybody in Japan hated me because they probably love koalas more than any other nation in the world, certainly more than we do. Um, and when we released our report, the week before, Michael Jackson was on the front page of the Australian cuddling a koala and um, uh, the Clinton's daughter, Chelsea Clinton, was on the front page of the, um, the Australian cuddling a koala. <coughs> um, so they decided not to shoot them even though that is by far the most effective and humane way to deal with this overpopulation problem where they're actually killing trees. You could walk up to a tree and see five koalas in it and no leaves. They were killing the trees. They were going to starve. They knew that to do something. So what did they decide to do? Well, sterilise them. They, knew, they were smart enough to know there's no point sterilising the males. And again, they said, let's do a big complicated population model. I said, no, we don't need a population model. If you're going to sterilise the females, how, what fraction of the female population do you have to sterilise just to stop the population growing? You know it. The average female produces three females during her life. You don't have to write any equations. It's logic. You have to sterilise two-thirds of the females when they're very young. And then one-third will produce three and the population will roughly stabilise. And then they worked out all the costs and they realised they would never sterilise more than about 30% of the females because kangaroo is difficult to get to, it's very expensive. They were spending 5 to $10 million a year. It was never going to work. What happened? Well, they all burnt in a big fire. Anyway, problem solved. <laughs> um, uh, most of the koalas got killed in the, in the Big Ash Wednesday fires, which raised through eastern Australia, all those fires, but also in the, they raised through uh, South Australia. So, to be honest, I sort of feel like I, I did uh, 320 interviews in a year and a half. Uh, and generally, I was portrayed as being an evil, horrible mathematical scientist who had no heart. Um, but to be honest, uh, dying by being shot is far more benign than being caught, which terrifies them, sterilised in a caravan, translocated to another part of the continent to die quite slowly. Uh, over six months to 12 months. That's what they did to most of the koalas. And it didn't work because they couldn't catch enough. And then finally, uh, they die in the bushfire. And now they have an opportunity. They could now contain the population by sterilisation because there's probably only a couple of thousand. But they won't because they don't understand geometric growth. That said, I suppose the real point is there, uh, you don't have to build a complicated model to give them a very simple answer to the issue how many do you need to sterilise to stable the population? You can work it out with relatively simple logic. You don't have to build those models. <coughs> the second thing, um, so what, what can I say about that? I learned a lot about how not to communicate. And I also learned if you're talking to a newspaper, don't let them photograph you from below. Because <laughs> they go up your nose. And whatever way you look imperious and haughty, 
So you know now everybody does photograph like that. You look you look thinner and lovelier, but but when you're young and being having people don't when the when the photographer from the newspaper crouches down, um, you either run or crouch down yourself. That's the, <laughs> that's the only response possible, because and also if they take a lot of pictures, I can guarantee you, you know how like when Peter Dutton or or John Howard's being up in the news, if they want to make John Howard look sage and wise, they pick one of their thousand file photos. They want to look him, make him look dopey or sleepy. So don't let them take lots of photos because they'll, they'll pick the photo that plays to their story. Great Barrier Reef rezoning, and, and have, they've done some spatial planning in the course of the last two weeks, bit, maybe, have they? You don't know? No, none. So um, the Great Barrier Reef, around about 1995, most of the Great Barrier Reef was not protected. Only around about 5% was protected. Most of the Great Barrier Reef was, 95% was, was fished. And so at that time, the uh, Federal Environment Minister, I think it was our best ever Federal Environment Minister, Robert Hill, because he came from South Australia, um, and they're all lovely people, uh, he said, that's ridiculous. Most people think the Great Barrier Reef is the world's biggest marine park, but you're telling me 95% is fished? So he was determined, and we lobbied him strong and hard, to not only rezone the Great Barrier Reef, but also to build a protected area system for the whole continent. And we've got some of that. But the question is, um, how are you now going to choose the bits of the Great Barrier Reef? This is a little of the Great Barrier Reef. There's green zones. We're just going to focus on the fully protected zones, the green and the pink zones there where there's no fishing, um, and then there's recreational fishing and commercial fishing in other places. How are we going to pick the best places to do that using mathematics? Because in the past, what we typically do in nature reserve design is just pick iconic places, the prettiest reef, the place where all the, the turtles breed. And it's very much on single species, whether it's on the land or the sea, big mountains, waterfalls, all those sorts of things. But during that period of time, a lot of people in the United States and Australia had been developing a theory of reserve design that was built around representation. So what is systematic marine reserve design? It's basically in words, is build me a connected or compact system of protected areas that equitably represents all habitats and species while annoying as few people as possible. You know, why, what's that about? Because if you protect a whole heap of places that are needed for uh, very popular for recreational fishers, very valuable for commercial fishers, needed to expand the port industry, you won't get the protected area system because thousands of letters will flood in to the minister's office. Or there's a bumper sticker in Queensland, I think it says, I fish, I vote, or I vote, I fish, one or the other, both. So that's the word problem. So what we did over a number of years is turn that into a mathematical problem and produce software to solve the problem. Uh, and that has generally worked reasonably well. So what is the background behind that? Is why is it, is it a simple problem or is it complicated? Great Barrier Reef is huge. A few hundred kilometres, 2,000 kilometres, 300 kilometres wide, enormous. In, in it there, uh, there's about 5,500 separate reefs and there's all the places between the reefs. And so the first thing is um, uh, we can, turn the whole thing into a system of sites, which may be reefs themselves. We know where different species are because ecologists have studied the Great Barrier Reef to death. We know where different habitats are. And we also know where different fishing industries go. There's the commercial industry and the recreational fishing. So we have all this spatial data. So now imagine the whole Great Barrier Reef divided into 17,000 17, polygons, sites, and any one of those 17,000 sites can be in the reserve system or not in the reserve system. How many reserve, how many reserve systems could we create? There's 17,000 places. Each one could be a zero or a one. I could, why can't I just randomly generate lots and lots of reserve systems and see which one the best? How many different reserve systems are there? Yes, it's two to the power of 17,000. Each of these places can be reserved or not. And they're all unique. So it's just two to the 17,000. Two to the 17,000 
that's roughly, you know, vaguely with a massive error rate, 10, one followed by 5,000 zeros. One followed by 5,000 zeros. So yes, you could look at every option and you could run every computer in the world, I would say for a very long time until, until Queensland gets quantum computing. I think, still think it's gonna be a long time. So we actually need a decent problem definition and we need some algorithms. What does this problem look like in the simplest possible sense? It's a, it's a set covering problem, it's an integer linear programming problem. And this is not the Great Barrier Reef problem because I've got eight sites and I've got 10 species. Um, yeah, and I'm not very good at marine ecology because I ran out of fish, so we ended up with another cute fish. This is a matrix, this is the sort of data that goes into the problem. These are eight sites, we know what's uh, in each site. And the simplest version of the problem is I would like obviously to protect one example of every habitat and every species. That's sort of the minimum you'd want. And so you think, well, that's easy. How do I do that? Well, I could set, I can conserve one example of everything. I could just conserve all the sites. But then actually I'd like to do it as cheaply as possible and annoying as few people as possible. I would do, like to do it with the smallest number of sites. So the answer is, What's the smallest number of sites that will conserve every species on that matrix? Assuming a one means the species is in the site. Three. Three. Who said, who said something? Two? Do we have a two? We have a two. What's two? What are the two sites? Oh, oh. Oh, oh right. Oh, okay. Well, put your head on the side. <laughs> yes, C and E, well done. You get the prize. There is no prizes, though. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so the thing is, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very small problem, uh, but the simple greedy algorithm, grab the site with the most species in it or features in it, and then add sites until you get all does not work, does not work. So in fact, at that time when we started this problem, the ecologists had formulated this problem, they hadn't written it down mathematically, and they were solving it with very simple heuristic algorithms, which were get me the site with the most species, and then add the site that adds the most to what I've already got. And I just said, that's not very good, that's wrong. And there's papers written by economists that proves that's wrong, this is a set covering problem, you haven't done the maths. Um, there's the answer. Um, oh, yeah. I think that's actually slightly skewed. Sorry, somehow the all the <laughs> looks all those blue dots should be one down. The projector has defeated me. Bottom line, C and E work together. And amazingly, E, which is a very efficient, is not a very rich site. It doesn't have much in it. <clears throat> now the Great Barrier Reef problem is this problem, but now 17,000 sites, about 300 features. The cost of every site is not the same. And the numbers in here are areas that are uh, uh, real numbers. They're, they're, not, they're not zeros and ones. So you can imagine this is not gonna be easy to do. Uh, of course, greedy is not good, so there's a moral to this whole thing. So this is the kind of data that we've been given uh, over the period of time. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Authority actually asked Myself and Bob Pressey, who unfortunately passed away last week, who was one of the founders of reserve design theory at James Cook University. Could we actually provide some tools to solve this problem? One of the interesting things was, for a long time, they gave us lots of biological data, like all the different kinds of reefs, where all the species are and the habitats are, and they refused to give us the economic data. And I said, you know, if you just give us the biological data, we could create solutions that really annoy the industry and you won't happen. And they said, no, we want a pure ecological answer. Nobody wants a pure ecological answer. This is not just an ecological question. This is a socioeconomic ecological question. So we ended up getting a lot of data on where people fish, so different places are fished more or less intensively and all those things go in. So what is the whole problem together? We wanted 20% of everything we could map we had some special rules around special features. Um, we wanted reserves to be of a particular size. 
we wanted to annoy as few people as possible and we wanted replicates for a lot of things. And a lot of that boiled down to this mathematical problem. It's not quite all of it, but most of it. So this is the standard reserve design problem. So it's not very big, is it? <coughs> What's the top line saying? It's saying, um, uh, what are all the bits of those problems saying to me without defining variables? So first thing, this is just saying, <coughs> is my control variable? Every site is in or out. There's I is something that goes from one to 17,000. Everything's in and out. It's like having a, a machine that has 17,000 17, on off buttons. That says I want to meet all my constraints. I want to conserve 20% of everything or a viable population of everything. You can be fairly flexible about that. The RIJ matrix is the matrix that you just saw, which tells you which species are in which sites. Annoy us if you annoy the Fisher folk as little as possible, every time you acquire a site, you pay a cost. And that could be an economic cost or a social cost. And we had to quantify that. And so you're trying to minimise the cost. You have to meet all your conservation targets. You minimise the cost. And this next bit was all about the compactness of the system. So there's a non-linear term. So it's a non-linear linear, um, integer programming problem. Um, and at that point, when we were looking at these problems, there was some software, um, LP Solve, CPLEX existed, but they actually struggled to do this problem and they would do it very, very slowly on about 400 sites. They would not run. So th remember, this is the dark ages, as far as most of you are concerned. This is 30 years ago. So we actually created a piece of software that used simulated annealing. Who's, who's, use simulated annealing or heard of simulated annealing in, in their work. It's, a, it's, 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 it's moronically simple but delightfully easy to explain. In simulated annealing, all you do is randomly make a reserve system. What is a reserve system? It's a 17,000 zeros and ones. Just make a random set of zeros and ones. And then you evaluate it based on its cost, its boundary length, how well you're meeting the targets. And then you get a score. And it's a low score if you miss targets. It's a low score if you, if you have a high cost. And then you flip one of the zeros or ones randomly. Just, just so this is really very simple stuff. You flip one. And if you get a better score, you take it. If you get a worse score, you occasionally take it. So simulated annealing works by you generally go downhill in this 17,000 dimensional binary world. You go downhill, but early on you'll occasionally go uphill when the system is hot. That's why it's called annealing, where you're annealing two metals together when they're hot. So you basically go downhill. Now, if you, you all know that if you have this incredibly complicated problem and you just go downhill, you'll go to a local minima, right? And that's useless. Absolutely useless. There'll be so many local minima here. The global minima is somewhere else. But if you are willing to accept that you're willing to make a few mistakes early on, lots and lots of mistakes, we're doing thousands and thousands of flip-flops, and then you slowly make it cooler and cooler so you're less likely to make a mistake, and then you make it cold and you just go downhill, you actually find deeper local minima. So my attempt to make a physical analogy is let's imagine, let's imagine QUT is broke and the floor is now a mess because for 50 years it's just turned into potholes and rubble and stuff like that. Michael's still here lecturing. He's, 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 he's gone bald. Um, <laughs> he's in a wheelchair. So if I want to, it was very complex. Someone says, where's the lowest point in this lecture theatre? You could just um, take a ping pong ball, put it on the ground and watch it go down. and It'll go to a local minimum. That's not the lowest point. But imagine now this is an earthquake simulating room. So I'm going to pick the whole room up, I'm going to shake it, and then the ping pong ball will move around and I'll slow it down, I'll slow it down, and I'll stop it. And ideally then, if the local minimum, the lo global minimum, or the deeper global minimum are more vaguely spatially correlated, you will generally head toward a place with some deeper patches, and then it'll go co cold, you'll stop the simulator, go down to the bottom. Now, you also know that's not going to give the global minimum, right? Why should it? But you do that a thousand times, and you get, a, you, you get something that's really pretty good. 
usually about 98, 90 percent as close as possible to global warming. The other thing that's very easy to sort of explain what you're doing, and it is a randomised process. And what we also found is we would get a lot of good answers. And the one thing you don't want to give to any government is the answer. You never want to give them the answer. You want to give them a range of answers. So now the software produces a lot of good answers, and then we often try and find three or four very different but very good answers. Because one or two percent difference in optimization is more or less irrelevant because there's all these other things they're thinking about that aren't in the problem. So I suppose my biggest point there is this. This, this software now builds half the protected area systems in the entire planet, from the Brazilian Amazon to the English Channel to Colombia. Pretty well everywhere in the world. It's changed 10% of the surface of the planet. The simple software, it was half of Ian Ball's PhD thesis. What my third, fourth PhD student was half of his thesis producing this software. Um, the fact, oddly, that we couldn't run the full nonlinear uh, integer programming problem and get exact answers was the reason why the software is successful. Because we didn't give people one answer. They would just say, I'm not, I don't even know this mess. I don't know what you're talking about. You're giving me one answer? So the fact we were forced into a, a non-optimal solution Therefore, we realised we'd give people a range of solutions. We wanted to give them a range of solutions that were very different. We used the various mathematical methods to find them different good answers. Was the strength of the system. So I suppose the other thing is the world's full of serendipity, right? So that's um, an attempt to explain. Um, and you never know when things that seem to be going badly might be in your favour. The only other thing I want to say about this particular problem is uh, it helps me also explain what I said at the beginning, the difference between a problem, a model, and an algorithm. Whenever I would try and explain this software, MarkSan, to people, they say, well, that's a model. And how, how can you produce I said, there's no modeling here. This is, there's the human word, there's the English language words, um, you know, get me a target for every species or habitat by putting things in or out of the reserve system, annoying industry as little as possible, a compact system. I've just turned it into maths. And that's not, I don't think that's a model. I think it's a problem definition. It's a translation process. And then the algorithm is Mark Sand. Mark Sand's not modeling. If anything, there are some hidden models. There might be models, species distribution models that created the matrix that tells you which species are in which places, because we haven't visited every reef in the Great Barrier Reef. So we would have some statistical models. Another hidden model is here, that if you protect something, the species is happy. If you don't protect it, the species is gone. That's actually a hidden assumption, and it's a model. So they're hidden models. So making that distinction, I think, is very important, because if you go into any industry, or any applied area, and you have to do any sort of opt um, um, optimization, decision science, people will be confused by those three issues. And then people would say, well, Mark Sands are, are, are an algorithm that's not perfect. And we say, yes, so you're losing 1%. The errors in this data are 10, 20, 30%. So who cares about the 1% inefficiency in the algorithm? Well, oh, yeah, good. I've written a slide that says everything I just said. And interestingly, sorry, that's not easy to read, you know, we as mathematicians uh, are trained to build models. And we, in fact, more often than not, we're trained to solve models and invent new algorithms. And that's what our focus is. But I can tell you, as my life has progressed, working out what the problem is, is the most important and intriguing part and can take years can take years. What is the problem that people want to solve? And can I plausibly took, take their hopes, dreams, and fears and put, in, put it in some form of algebraic form so I could use the wizardry of optimization to get an answer? And that talent is rare. Why is it rare? My biggest warning to all of you is if you go into a maths department with a problem, uh, most mathematicians have a toolbox with three tools and they're three Phillips head screwdrivers, all of different sizes. And if you want to nail something into a wall, it's not going to get you very far. 
you're better off using a saucepan than a Phillips head. So most mathematicians, to be blunt, want the problem that the policy person or the ecologist comes to them with to be solved by the tools they have in their toolbox, which they've been studying for 30 years. So hopefully most of you, however, will learn a variety of tools so that your toolbox has one Phillips head screwdriver, a spanner, and so forth. You have 20 tools in there. So you can actually fit, pick the tool that best suits them. And that's what gives mathematicians, particularly in universities, a bad name. Last example, um, <clears throat> and this one is, I suppose, this is the first one um, was some failure, more or less mostly failure. The second one is a massive success. So spatial planning and reserve design software has gone global. Uh, thousands of people are trained in it, and it's changing the face of the earth. This is a, a massive, another largely abject failure on my part, which is allocating funds rationally to protecting threatened species. I'll try and do this quickly because I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, you now are in charge of a country, and your country has four species. Um, you can save the polar bear, the Sumatran tiger, the koala bear, or the orchid. They've all been listed by the IUCN. The Sumatran tiger is critically endangered, all the way down to near threatened. We roughly know their extinction probability over the next, say, 30 or 40 years, and some are very likely to go extinct, some are not likely to go extinct. Uh, when I had this first meeting with the federal government in 1998, they were spending all their money, uh, not, no country has these species, they were spending all their money on critically endangered species. So Australia has 2,000 threatened species, about 200 are critically endangered, and they spend money on them, and they go down the list until they run out of money, and they get maybe a few endangered species. <clears throat> really, unless it's a koala, they'll just spend money like anything on that, even though it's not endangered, just because it's a koala. But more or less, the more endangered you are, the, you're more likely to get funding. <clears throat> and we only spend money on you know, probably 20% of all our threatened species to an adequate level. So I said, <clears throat> I, I said in this public, fairly public meeting, I think that's stupid. Why don't you try and save as many species as possible given the resources you have? And that won't always be the species that are most endangered because some species cost a lot. Look at that tiger. It is highly endangered, but it's very expensive to save. These are, these are not real numbers. They're just toy numbers. Um, and also, some species may be easy to save, and some species might be harder to save. Polar bears, climate change, ice is all disappearing. They're toast. Actually, they interbreed with brown bears, don't they, a little bit? So, you know, do they really matter? They're a white brown bear. So we get rid of them. So the probability of success or the importance, they could all, they, they, we need to think about all these things. <clears throat> and so they hated it. And they said, Hugh, that's triage. You're letting species go extinct. And I said, you're letting species go extinct. And they said, you're letting them. <laughs> so I said, quickly, I think you could just use cost effectiveness. Actually, an economist had written two papers on this five years before, which I didn't know about. I said, why don't you use simple cost effectiveness? So how should you logically combine these numbers? So some of them said, okay, we get it. Some of these factors are more and more important. And so they said, well, um, let's turn all these numbers into scores. We'll give big scores to more endangered species. We'll give big scores to species that we are more likely to succeed when we build the recovery plan in the recovery process and more likely to secure them. And we'll give low scores to expensive species. So the tiger gets two and the koala is cheap, so it gets four. We'll turn them into scores out of five, and then we'll add them up, and then we should spend first our money on the koala. It's not a bear. So that's, they'd say, and they actually often have multiple criteria here, like all these other things. They turn them into score, add them all up. Does that worry you? What should I do? Is there a logical way of these combining these numbers that actually is more likely to save as many species as possible? What is the ranking? So most species, most organisations still spend their money on the most threatened species. Nobody actually wrote the problem down mathematically. I've just given you a verbal problem. We didn't write any problem definition down. How can we spend a fixed budget to do actions that maximise the number of species per secure over 50 years or minimise the number of extinctions? What does that look like? 
And what is the solution to that? The simple solution is actually just cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is not perfect, and I'll show you what's perfect in a second. Cost effectiveness is the best way to combine those numbers. So what's the cost effectiveness? It's the benefit times the probability of success divided by the cost. That's the only logical way to combine those three numbers. So I, a few years, we, I went to different states, Queensland, New South Wales, and they said, well, why is your algorithm any better than ours? We were turned in the scores and added them up. Why is it any better? And I just said, because it's right. And, and, the, and we went again round and round circles. So I, I was saying, I'm, you know, I think communication failure after communication failure. I said, it's logic, isn't it? Because this is how you shop, right? If you go and if you want to buy a lot of bananas because you have an orangutan at home, you can go to Coles and there might be five kilograms for $10. And you can go to Woolworths and there could be eight kilograms for $12. You go for the eight kilograms for twelve dollars, not the five kilograms for ten dollars, because you get more kilograms per dollar, which is benefit divided by cost. But then, if you found when you took the Woolworths bananas home, twenty percent of the time the orangutan wouldn't eat them because they don't like Woolworths or how they pay their staff. So twenty percent. So you'd multiply the benefit by eighty percent because only eighty percent of the time does it work. There's only one way to do that. And people have been doing that calculation since currency was invented in 600 BC. I look at my wife, who's an ancient historian. So they've been doing that forever. And you can't do it? Anyway, there's only one logical way of combining numbers. And it gives you different answers. You know, the koala's on the bottom. Well, I can, so people, this happens all the time. People create. Uh, quantitative approaches to solving problems that, ha that appear to be mathematical and make no logic. And when you first see them, you think that's logical. But then you start thinking more about it, but what is the problem? <clears throat> so we have this world of pseudo quantification that bedevils us. And I can tell you that hundreds of organisations and governments have created scoring systems that allocate funds to any environmental problem. And they think they're smart and they think they're doing a good job because they use numbers. So they're mathematicians, right? So your task is how do you explain, no, we need to write the problem down, we need to find a heuristic, in this case cost effectiveness, it's a plausible answer. Technically this is the knapsack problem. So actually I won't go through all that, which is all the data. This is the knapsack problem. So this is the mass of the problem, sorry again about the red font. We're basically maximising the number of species we save subject to a budgetary constraint and you can either work on the species or not. So it's another three line, in this case integer programming problem. If you Google, if you look up NAPSAP problem, technically cost effectiveness is slightly suboptimal. So why is it called the NAPSAP problem? You imagine you're going hiking and you've got 20, a 20 litre pack or you say I'm not going to carry more than 20 kilograms. You can put objects in there and each one brings you some benefit, but it has a cost. And if you put in eggs, because you want eggs, there's a probability it doesn't work. So basically that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to maximize your happiness. Do I take a tent or four kilograms of chocolate? So that's the knapsack problem. It's a well-known mathematical problem. It comes up all over industry, all over the world. This is the knapsack problem. And it is, uh, you ideally use an integer linear programming package to solve it. The trouble is with that, nobody will understand the answer. And to be honest, cost effectiveness is usually about half a percent wrong if you have a long list of species. You've got a list of species at one or 200 long, it doesn't matter. So you're basically filling the pack with the most cost effective species. And then near the end, the reason why it's not quite right is you may end up with a little space, and usually that's where you stuff the socks in, right? But there's this little space and you don't get the next most cost effective species won't fit in that space. So ideally you'd rearrange the entire pack and do all these weird things, but you can't do it. But it's benefit times probability of success divided by cost should be familiar to people, should be explicable, and should be able to be deployed. 
So what did I say? I turned up to the federal government and started talking. You can do all these other weird things with that about weighting species, putting uncertainties, and we've, I suppose, written now a dozen papers around this problem. 1998, we wrote the papers. Liana Joseph did a very good example. New Zealand started using it in 2009. How many places in the world do this? New Zealand, New South Wales, and almost nobody else. US Fish and Wildlife Service have been talking to us. Queensland are thinking about it. How bad is my communication skill 25 years later? So, and why? Uh, they often say because there's all these other things going on. And I say, well, wait, if you really love koalas, just lock them in if you like. And that's what New South Wales do. If you want to weight them by their taxonomic uniqueness, put it in. We can weight those things, that's fine. Um, but it is odd that we can't get anywhere with that problem. You might have, like to have some reflections as why is this simple cost effectiveness approach to allocating funds for threatened species uh, not progressing through different governments' policies. And the, I quickly like to end and I'll take questions. This sort of my heroes in this world, Robert MacArthur, who I unfortunately never met. <coughs> if you haven't read some of his stuff, you should. He started the field of foraging theory, island biogeography, and so many other things and really turned ecology uh, into, into a, a fundamental theory, he really founded theoretical ecology. And, and so many people who he can say that they knew of Robert May before I put his name on the slide. Um, I would probably say Australia's f most famous ever scientist, um, who was a professor of physics at Sydney University, went to Princeton to work with MacArthur, ended up in Oxford, was the chief scientist of the United Kingdom, and he was the president of the Royal Society, some would say the most prestigious academic institution in the world, an Australian. Very angry, sweary Australian, but an Australian nevertheless, who has an enormous influence over what many people have done and died relatively recently. Um, so, uh, um, I would say the most interesting thing from what I'm trying to say is thinking carefully of how you explain people who want problems to solve, how you can give them solutions and give them answers and give them processes, algorithms, models and problems that they feel comfortable with is a challenging task. If you're working in aeronautical engineering, don't worry, you're laughing, right? Because they're engineers, they live by maths. If you're working in, working in the environment area, where some people are intuitively quite good at maths, but they don't use it on a daily basis, you have to be very calm, you have to be very patient, and you have to be willing to give them lots and lots of examples about how these things can work. And occasionally you get these gigantic impacts like spatial planning, where now almost all the protected area systems in the world are designed with Ian Ball software. And I'll have you take any questions. Yeah, fantastic talk. You teased us about offsets at the beginning, so I'm wondering if I can oh, force yeah. you to say a couple of words about that. Said offsets, yes. Uh, we did, Martine, Marin, Megan Emmons, and I designed Australia's biodiversity offsets calculator. Do you, has any, does any, has he been know much about offsets? Offsets are, I'm building a coal mine, I'm destroying 100 hectares of vegetation um, of a certain quality, uh, and or I'm affecting uh, listed threatened species what do I have to do to restore it? So we, we, they had one of these arcane scoring systems. So if you were offsetting with a piece of vegetation that was slightly better connected, you got two points. And if it was well connected, you get three points. And if it wasn't connected, you got zero points. So they had layer upon layer of arbitrary decision. And we took them all out. <clears throat> and we redesigned all their offsetting spreadsheets. We gave it back to them, but we kept the color scheme. So they had three linked spreadsheets. One was green, olive, one was burnt orange, and one was light blue. And we made a new system that was completely different, entirely logical, and we gave it back to them. And they thought we hadn't done much because we kept the colour scheme. And then we wrote a paper with them 
and um, that's what's used now. And that offsetting scheme has been used by the countries. Yeah, there's a lot of technical things in there, but it, it, it's not much more than logic and algebra. There's no complicated maths in there. It's logic and algebra. I got a question. <clears throat> I'm a, um, like half these students want to become academics, which is a fair call. Oh, um, foolish. They want to be useful but, too. Oh, yes. And when they apply for a job, they'll be asked, show me your Phillips screwdrivers. And I want them to be all Phillips screwdrivers and big long range of them from huge to small, but they're all the same. And if you show me, if you say instead, look, I can hammer a nail into the wall with a pot yeah. or I can screw this in with a knife. Like, mm -hmm. sure, you can do a lot of things, but none of them particularly well. So how do you, when you apply for yes. a job, how do you sell this jack of all trades approach? Well, I don't know. I think some, some maths departments are more amenable to that if from an academic. Sometimes mathematicians find themselves in other departments. So they end up in engineering departments and, and you know, there's plenty of engineers are doing a lot of, or continuously doing a lot of mathematics. Um, I, I actually obviously went from maths and I don't know why they appointed me at Adelaide to an environmental science. And when I came here, I said I demanded a job that was half in the maths department and half in the biology department. So I could have the best of both worlds. You know, I could steal the good math students to solve my problems, but then I was proselytizing to all the people who wanted to save the world. So, you know, um, we should have more joint appointments, to be blunt. I mean, there are, the universities are siloed organizations and you sit in faculties and schools. In fact, as my life has progressed, I've had more and more jobs where I'm something else half the time or quarter of the time. We should have people who are half academics and half in industry working for Shell, or we should have them as half in mathematics and half in government, or people should be going to government from academia and coming back after three years. So, you know, the other thing I would say to anybody that does pursue an academic career, don't get to the age of 72 and realise you've been sitting in the same office teaching the same lectures for 40 years, because half the academics in the world are like that. And it's not good for them. It's not good for the rest of the world. You know, at least change office. You could change <laughs> the, the, the colour of the carpet on your floor. Some of them won't do that, and, and particularly in maths departments. But you, you should branch out. And if a position comes up in the government where they want some advice and you can be seconded there for six months, take it. Or working for a mining company or whatever you want to do. Because um, those things are gold, you take those experiences, take them back to your students and they love you. So you choose to talk about your most impactful projects and talk like this and that's great. And we, we need to hear about those things. There were two failures there. Gr yeah, but even your, fa three. your failure was like, oh, only three governments have used this process to make their decisions. I wish I'd taken over the world. <laughs> Um, but in some years, you publish literally a paper a week. You've published, you know, hundreds of papers through your career, and you've spot in this type of situation. You speak about the most impactful ones. I was hoping that you oh. could reflect upon your PhD papers mm. um, and tell us about like what impact did those have on the world, and none. is it none? <laughs> I did five pa papers from my PhD in Oxford, where where I had no supervision. Um, they took a long time to get out. They all got out eventually. They were about the foraging theory of hummingbirds and bees, which is what I was interested in. So actually, I was very interested in questions that MacArthur and May had asked, was why are there so many species in the world? So this is pure, pure ecology, using maths to solve pure, an esoteric question is why, why, why are there five species of hummingbird in this part of the forest and seven species of bee in the St John's Oxford Garden. Why are there those numbers? So, uh, no, but I, I was lucky that I learned more and more maths. I actually, that's when I, because I was studying foraging theory, I learned a lot of optimization. I learned to do stochastic dynamic programming. Actually, I hated it when I first did it because I thought it was an annoying, messy algorithm. It wasn't very elegant. And then foraging theory, and then I got actually, in terms of accidents, some of the worst things that happened end up being the best thing that can happen. I got, about third year into teaching applied maths, the two people who taught optimization and mathematical programming left, and they said, Hugh, can you teach that? And I said, I've never done it before. <laughs> never done any. I'd missed all that. I'd done probability, economics, all these other things. And I had to learn a whole heap of stuff, and I didn't want to do it. 
And so I have to say then, being forced to do things you don't want to do is usually the best thing that happens in your life. And then I knew enough about optimization to be mildly dangerous. And then to get all those papers, I just exploited you and Michael and Nadia and all these other people who have been my students. And they wrote them. Yeah, Exploitation. Some um, master, master so trick. a question from Pablo is, hmm. where did you learn to think critically so well? Is it through life experience or ecological academic experience? And how do you begin to think so broadly when looking for applications towards niche problems? Um, I think you, it's hard to learn the problem definition and how do you turn a complicated situation, a socioeconomic ecological situation into something. And you can only learn that by seeing examples. I don't think there's any way. So we had, a, Adelaide in maths, we had some, a very strong applied maths department, uh, Ren Potts, and he taught us about how to control traffic lights. Uh, we had Bill Henderson, who taught us game theory, uh, and then we had Charles Pierce talk uh, to us about telecommunications and QE theory. So they were very, very applied things, and I don't think they ever, nobody is taught to model, and nobody's ever taught to, to find, but if you see enough of them, you eventually work out how to do it. I also come from, I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm the only male in the entire Possingham clan that's not an engineer. So I'm just an embarrassment generally, but I was born with an engineering brain. I was born with a mother who was the first, second woman in Australia to get a PhD in physics. So, you, so I have to say what I didn't say at the beginning of this lecture, I have so many layers of privilege in my life. It's insurmountable. It's about 1% talent and hue and 99% privilege and birthright. So there you go, privilege and birthright, go and get it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I have had so many advantages, it's unbelievable. Thanks Hugh, that was great. Um, you seem to have a bit of a focus on simple approaches hmm. and I'm wondering whether that's for the purposes of explaining what you've done for policy yes. or whether something that's more complex and captures more of the different features of the problem is more trusted. Yes. So I feel like it's a, it's a yes. tricky balance and I don't know what the right answer ever is. Yes, I suppose that's where, you know, they say modeling and I suppose I would say, modeling in general, people often say is more art than science, right? It's how complicated to make a model is definitely an art form or you know, a few parameters, how much can you estimate? But then there's this interpretability of the model that you end up with. And I would say algorithms are true, as most people think, what is the best algorithm? And I don't think anybody ever tell, told me to produce a dodgy algorithm because it was, that would be one or 2% wrong. I don't think any of my optimization lecturers, or they, might, they might be rolling in their graves now to know that we've done this stuff. But in the end, people were not big fans of black box algorithms for policy. And so <clears throat> if you can do some little tweaks to simplify the original problem so that a, a more simple um, algorithm that can be better explained works, or you use a very simple algorithm like cost effectiveness or cost utility analysis, usually you can steal them from economics, show them how it roughly works, give them the answer, and then say, actually, this, this is not that great and you have accurate enough data, but more or less my black box thing, which is doing the real integer programming problem or other optim dynamic optimization issue, that's giving you the right answer and I can't explain it to you. I think that's fine. That's another pathway. You'd have to socialize them with the explicable algorithm though. And that's what we forget to do. We forget to do that often because we're so obsessed with the accuracy and, and we, you know, experts in this area want to argue about the accuracy of those approaches. So, yeah, it's, 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 and then it all depends who you're talking to, when you're talking to them and the circumstances you're in. So to be blunt, you have to be something that maybe mathematicians aren't always trained to be do because there's a, there's a theorem and there's a proof and there's an answer, right? Well, you just have to give up on that and say, I'm going to 
be adaptable and I'm going to provide some different answers in different circumstances that may not be perfect, but they're close enough, is good enough. And it's better than what they were doing. I suppose that's the main thing. It's better than what they're going to do. Yeah. Uh, thank you. you uh, your talk is great. Uh, my problem is quite related to Sarah's problem that um, as a PhD student, as, I mean, as a research student, MP student, I see the trend that people are tracing more and more complicated method mm. or there's no choice like it, the method of developing you have to choose the complicated method and when you try to explain things you, you like you said you want we to socialize our uh, method or to to talk them simply to the uh, general public but yeah how 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 how, how do do you think do you think that it, there's no way that the student now they just cannot choose simple uh, like method. They I, have I to... see what you mean. So uh, to a certain extent, you've got to have multiple personalities. So you know, yes, when you're at the maths conference, you're going into the details of everything, and you're talking about the small improvements you've made on past algorithms because that's your contribution to mathematics and science. And and uh, but then you quickly have to work out who else you need to talk to or as an exercise that many of you probably have done at some point in your life, a favourite exercise with my lab, is <coughs> imagine the, the vice chance, uh, somebody, you, the taxi driver says, what do you do? And you say, I'm, I use maths to solve ecological problems. And they say, usually, I don't understand. I didn't know maths had anything to do with ecology. Well, what are you going to say? I just learned to eventually give a fisheries example because a lot of people know what fishing is. You realise the, the size limits and the catch takes that we have for Snapper in Moreton Bay are determined by modellers and statisticians and they make sure that we don't catch too many fish so there are hardly any left and we, we op pick the sizes so that the females are big enough to breed and just give them that sort of statistical math without using stats or math. So I'll give them something they're familiar with. Then the second one is uh, what happens if the Vice Chancellor comes through the door and says, I've got $10 million for a new research centre, what do you do? Well, that's another question. And you should be able to answer that because you probably that will happen to you with a big funder or philanthropist or vice chancellor, happen to you three times in your life. And you get one shot and you might say, I'm going to build some software that will improve how we build protected areas across the entire planet. And in the past, what people have been doing is very poor, I think we can do a lot better job. And so you need something. You need a, and you should practice that sentence. And the, the third one is you're at a maths conference and you're in the, in the, the lunch line and somebody and who might be giving you a postdoc or a tenure track position says, you know, what do you do? Now then you've got to impress them with technical detail, right? And work out what they know about it and how you can imp impress them in five sentences. So you, you, you need f at least three, if not five or six elevator pitches, and you need to be able to quickly judge which elevator pitch to pull out. So, yeah. The second, the second thing is that if a vice chancellor can be your exemplary. Yeah. <laughs> but in my mind, I feel like modeling is quite cheap. You don't need money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's why I feel like, uh, well, I just need a desk and top, laptop to do the modeling. Right. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so um, <laughs> yes, I agree with you. I mean, what you do need is other people um, to work with you. And so if, if I was to say one thing that I've done, which not many mathematicians don't do, many scientists don't do, is I have an interesting idea. I give it to my postdocs and PhD students. And I don't pursue it. And some people can't do that. Some people have an idea and they say, well, this is my idea. I'm going to write the paper. I'm going to be first author. So in this field, fortunately for me, there were 500 ideas. And I've had 95 PhD students and 80 honours students and 100 postdocs. And I gave them those ideas. And they came up with better ideas. Or they told me my ideas were stupid. But the bottom line is, it was like this whole field was, there were so many opportunities and they're still going on. The opportunities in this space were so big, that it was easy to share. So I would say cooperation and sharing is the secret. 
Uh, and we also ran a lot of our groups off workshops where we bring in people like Mike from overseas or Ken and say, let's brainstorm this complicated problem and we'll all be on the paper. And probably after three days, we'll have invented seven papers. And you know, you, you can do one of them, this PhD student can do another. So you know, if you can create a place where people are sharing of ideas, then everybody benefits. Many departments, um, uh, people are very protective of their uh, ideas and they never tell anybody because once, when they were, at one point in their career, they had an idea and somebody stole it and they published it. And that's happened to me plenty of times. But the benefits of sharing far outweigh the costs that you get from losing something. Unless you only have one idea, <laughs> then you should probably keep it, I think. I think you should keep it, yeah. Let's end, let's end on that mixed message. Um, <laughs> But can you join me in a round of applause for Hugh and um, thanks for coming.